You're listening to P-R-O-X. I was reading something. I think it was like, oh, it's on IMDb. Have you seen it? Oh, no, I haven't actually. Upcoming Projects Anthem, of which you're not just a composer, but a producer. <laughs> it reads, it centers on Chris Bowers and Dahi as they venture out on a musical journey across the U.S. experimenting to reimagine the national anthem. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, is that how I pitch this to Chris? <laughs> One thing we're really excited about with our show, In Proximity, is the chance to share our new projects with you, our listeners. On this episode, we're honored to feature Anthem, an upcoming documentary streaming on Hulu on June 28th, produced by Proximity and our partners and directed by our head of nonfiction, Pete Nix. Anthem features acclaimed composer Chris Bowers and Grammy-winning producer Dahi as they take a musical journey traveling across America to create a new sound inspired by what our country's national anthem might be if written in today's time. Pete Nix is an Emmy Award-winning filmmaker whose work includes The Waiting Room, The Force, Homeroom, and the upcoming Stephen Curry, Underrated. Chris Bowers is an award-winning pianist, filmmaker, and composer known for his thought-provoking playing style, creating genre-defying film compositions that pay homage to his classical and jazz roots. His remarkable body of work includes Dear White People, Space Jam A New Legacy, When They See Us, Queen Charlotte, A Bridgerton Story, and Marvel's Secret Invasion. Later this year, we'll hear his work on the highly anticipated The Color Purple musical, directed by past guest of the pod, Blitz Bazawule. Definitely check out Blitz's episode with our founder, Ryan Kugler, if you haven't already. On Anthem, Chris is not only a composer and producer, he stars in the film and is in front of the camera, filmed by Pete on their musical adventure. So for this episode, Pete and Chris met up at a recording studio in Los Angeles, California, to reflect on their collaboration on Anthem and on their experiences making personal documentaries. Hi, my name's Peter Nix. I'm a producer and director. I'm also the head of nonfiction at Proximity Media. Right now we're here at Silent Zoo Studios, which is where we filmed the interviews for our film anthem yeah and i'm chris bowers and um i'm primarily a composer and pianist also dabbling a bit in directing and producing we gotta go from like dabbling to like full on <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i need my own uh maybe at least what, like 10 years under my belt then maybe i'll feel like oh that's what i do <laughs> i'm kind of conflicted because we don't want to lose the brilliance that you have to offer us in the music space though but they'll always be combined. At least what I'm going to focus on will always have a strong focal point in the sound and music. You made a film, um, a documentary, not just a film, but a documentary. Was that your first film or had you done stuff before that? It's definitely my first like public film. Concerto is a Conversation is a, a film that follows me writing this uh, violin concerto. And as I'm dealing with imposter syndrome, I have a conversation with my grandfather to ask him questions about his own life and his journey to get advice from him about how what he did in his life might help inform my own journey. What were your motivations? Like, why did you want to tell that story? You know, it's funny because it came about in a pretty organic, like, kismet way. Like, basically, Ben Proudfoot, my co-director, he had originally approached me about making a documentary about me writing this concerto. Like he was originally tasked by the LA Phil to do a couple of short docs on LA based music stories. And he, us being friends, saw that I was doing this show or this piece at Disney Hall and was like, oh, that might be interesting. Like, I know you haven't done that before. Do you mind if we just follow you with the camera essentially? And it just so, it turned out that the day that we were meeting to have our first conversation about it. I was coming from this event that was celebrating my grandfather, where they were naming the block, the retail square that he owns in downtown LA. They were naming it after him, like the uh, Bowers Retail Square. And it's like, you know, nine in the morning and I show up late to my own studio and I'm dressed up and Ben was like, what's going on? Like, why do you look like this essentially? And I just kind of talked about why I was late and this event. And then the more we talked about me and my life and my career, 
the more that I was like, I mean, I keep having to point back to the fact that I wouldn't be here without my grandfather making all these sacrifices and doing this, this incredible um, journey. He hitchhiked here when he was 17. He didn't have anything when he got here and he built this, um, a lot of our family wealth and, and um, foundation himself and with my grandmother and them as a family. And, and so the more I talked about it, at some point in that conversation, Ben was like, this is the movie. Like, can we, can we bring your grandfather in? Can we talk to him? Like, what do you think about that? And would you mm -hmm. mind interviewing him? And I even got more excited at that point, just because before I felt like a bit more self-conscious about what is this documentary going to be? And then mm -hmm. as soon as it felt like, oh, I can have a conversation with my grandfather. And, and I knew Ben's work as a filmmaker. And so I was like, for nothing else, if I just have this conversation with my grandfather captured in the way that I know it's going to look based on the other films he makes. That's going to be like something I'm going to treasure forever mm -hmm. that I'll share mm -hmm. with my kids and my grandkids, hopefully. And so for me, that was like the win it was just like, I get to record a conversation with my grandfather. And when we got to my grandfather's house, Ben was like, just ask him like, what's on your heart? Like, just, you know, talk about whatever. And for me at that time, I was dealing with so much imposter syndrome that felt like it was like, the loudest it had ever been in my mm. mind up until that point. And in my mind, I was like, I know my grandfather being this, you know, barely high school educated black man from the South that moved here, didn't know anybody and, and built a business and, and raised a family must have dealt with moments of imposter syndrome. And so let me ask him about that. And the conversation that came from it was so amazing and enlightening just in terms of like, the mental toughness that he had in order to survive the time he lived in. That, you know, that's the thing. Part of me wishes I could have seen that movie before I talked to my dad, because my mm -hmm. process, when I made my film, it was the first time that I really spoke to my parents about what happened to me and the problems that I had in college and with drugs and getting arrested and dealing with that and the shame that that brings to a family. But it was the first time that I ever asked my dad point blank, are you an alcoholic? Hmm. And there's so much more to his story than just his drinking. In fact, most of what people know about my dad are, he was a clinical psychologist and incredibly well respected. What he had to navigate to get to where he was, I can only imagine. And we didn't really find out until much later the imposter syndrome, the things that really pulled at him hmm. are probably those things that led him to self-medicate, you sure. know, and, and his father, my grandfather, you know, came from the South, Charleston, hmm. South Carolina, um, Gullah. We were sort of, you know, part of the, sort of the Gullah community there and ancestors of slaves from that region. Hmm. And a lot of those stories were kind of locked in and never explored. And there's one interview I have of my grandfather before he passed away. Oh, wow. And, you know, when I saw your piece, I did have that pull of regret that, you know, it's so rare that we have an opportunity for our generations to have conversations with each other. And, and when you do, when you set the context right, the power of that is 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 undeniable and you get this sort of range of storytelling. So I, I you know, I think that's part of why your, your film touched me so deeply. I appreciate that. Yeah. Do you feel like with your film... What struck me is the vulnerability and the honesty of like the conversation you're having about the experience that you had gone through and to be at a point where you're not looking for a way to either vindicate your actions or, or to like point to some sort of reason. Like you definitely give context as far as like, you know, binge drinking in colleges and like colleges providing alcohol and like some of the generational things that maybe led to it. But just in terms of like, you know, the thing I've always loved about you as a filmmaker is your unbiased approach to very difficult topics. And I imagine there must have been a lot of difficulty with being unbiased with your own personal life. Like, how did you approach that? My mind's going in like three or four different <laughs> directions right now. You know, I had my own sort of imposter syndrome, right? So sort of being this mixed race kid who's mm -hmm. adopted into a, a black family and trying to find my own identity within that. And I think... It's going to be a lifelong process for me trying to understand that. That's why part of the reason why I think I was drawn to storytelling was it was a way for me to be able to express that. Hmm. But um, my family never, there was never a framework for being able to sort of engage these difficult questions, you know, to acknowledge 
my father's story, which was never really sort of talked about. I found out after he passed away that, you know, when he was young, a young man, he had to step into the gutter when white people approached it. That this is what he was, mm. this is what he was taught, you know, and that sort of becomes part of your identity, yourself, that narrative that you tell yourself and those self-destructive tendencies become kind of burned into the DNA. They talk about sort of like epigenetics right. and sort of generational trauma. But because I had such a diverse experience being a mixed race kid, adopted into a, a very African-American family, going to mostly white private schools, then getting in trouble, going to prison and getting out of prison, falling in love with a refugee from Laos, you know, having mixed race kids who were white, black, African-American, it allowed me to sort of see life from all these different angles. Mm. And it kind of set me up perfectly for The Way We Met, which was The Force, which was a film exploring the impact of policing on our communities, particularly African-American communities. It allowed me to step into that film in a way radically different than, say, my partner, Ryan Coogler, would be able to approach it because we just, I was never thrown down on the ground you know, by a cop. I was never followed around in, in a store. You know, I think I was called nigger on a handful of occasions, but that was usually when I was with my fam, uh, my other family. Mm. You know, I only knew these stories through my grandfather telling the stories or through my father telling the stories, but those stories weren't often told, mm. you know? And so in a weird way, my experience allows me this, whatever you want to call it, objectivity or dispassionate, position to observe and to try to make sense of the world that as I see it around me. And that is sort of a big part of the DNA of me as a filmmaker. Hmm. Do you think you would ever do anything as personal as the wolf in the future? Well, we're adapting the wolf into a fiction piece, which Mm -hmm. is um, loosely based around the time that I spent in federal prison in the early 90s. So I I am continually trying to understand and and make sense of my own story, um, my family's story, the story of our country. I like to say I was born into the story of race in America Hmm. in 1968. You know, my birth mother was was white. My birth father was black. Her family threatened to, um, I don't know if threatened to disown her is too strong, but there was tension Hmm. in, in 1968 around a white woman, for sure, marrying a black man and having a child. Sure. Um, and so she made the difficult decision to give me up for adoption. So that's always been the sort of origin and genesis of my story. And it's part and parcel of what we struggle with increasingly as a country today with matters of race and identity and how we fit together as a country and mm. our histories. There's so much tension now around this notion of critical race theory, of, mm-hmm. of sort of looking back and trying to allow our history to inform our present. And um, it's really no accident that led me to sort of meet you when we were making the force. And then then ultimately when this idea of taking a look at the national anthem came up, like you were the first person, you know, Uh, obviously I thought of, Um, because in some ways you're to me, like you're, I don't know what the word is. You're not my doppelganger, but you're, you're some, (laughs) you compliment me in a certain way, just the same way that Ryan compliments me. Like we mm-hmm. were all black artists, but we have different life experience. And I learned this when I was at Howard, like being black doesn't mean one thing. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean one way of talking. Doesn't mean one way of dressing. It doesn't mean one story that you come from. And that's always, that's increasingly fascinated me and, and something that I feel like uh, that we need as a country, we need these stories to be told in diverse, surprising ways. I was just going through the email and I saw that we have this uh, air date <laughs> for mm-hmm. Anthem. Yeah. And it's like, oh man, it's starting to get real. <laughs> not, 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 not that it's not real, but it's been a journey. And we completed the film a while ago and there's been this sort of gap as we prepare to take it out to the world. Mm-hmm. And I was reading something, I think it was like, oh, it's 
on IMDb. Have you seen it? Oh, no, I haven't actually. Upcoming Projects Anthem, of which you're not just a composer, but a producer. <laughs> it reads, it centers on Chris Bowers and Dahi as they venture out on a musical journey across the U.S. experimenting to reimagine the national anthem. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, is that how I pitch this to Chris? <laughs> sure. I'm not totally sure. So do you remember like when I first pitched this to you? Yeah, I remember, it was um, either 2019, I think, maybe 2018. I think 2018, actually. Okay, yeah. yeah. I remember beginning, you, beginning. I remember you came to my studio and we talked about it. And I feel like it was, you know, in the beginning, such a vague idea of exploring the national anthem and, and how, I guess, essentially how relevant it is to today's time or how, whether or not there's room to explore the idea of our relationship with it at this point. And in the beginning, I think, like we were just talking about, kind of like what you were saying about almost being like creative doppelgangers, or like, you know, uh, internal doppelgangers. I feel like so much of my draw to you as a filmmaker is this ability to handle very complex situations uh, in an unbiased way. And so I think for me, you mentioning the National Anthem, like if, if anybody else brought me a project about the National Anthem, I probably would have said no from the jump. <laughs> and I think oh, that man. for you to say it, I was like, okay, well, I know, especially after seeing The Force and seeing how you handled such a, a hot topic of the Oakland Police Department in such a elegant way, I was like, okay, well, I, I feel safe as a mm -hmm. collaborator exploring this. And also just for me, I, I like we've been talking about, I'm so fascinated by the gray area of life. Like I, yeah. I really get frustrated when people present things in black and white ways. And so uh, to explore that, I really wanted to do that in this kind of gray area. Um, and I think early on, we just kind of talked about the idea of uh, reimagining a new anthem for today's time based on... I think it was the reimagining the anthem, but in the beginning, there was a little bit more of like telling the story of the Star Spangled Banner. Right. I, I think the initial pitch, if I'm remembering right, was that we were going to delve into the history of the Star Spangled Banner. And then we found this like, I don't know at, at what point we found out this little factoid that the tune mm. was not an American, it was a British tune. Mm -hmm. Like the melody on which the Star Spangled Banner was built was a British, not pub song, there's some debate about this, we, mm, <laughs> sure. um, parlor song or a gentleman's club tune mm. was not an American tune, which led me to be thinking about well what is what is an american melody what is the american voice um and that if we could both tell the story of of the history of that song in an in engaging way and then along the the journey of doing that compose a, a new anthem how cool would that be and i was just imagining you creating this new anthem yeah and that just that it was like i'm sold can we come up with a new anthem what, how, and how do we do that <laughs> yeah for sure yeah now that you say that i definitely remember you almost like breaking it down into these like three sections it was like archival and then like interviews with people talking about you know performing the anthem and then the third part being about this exploration of this new piece of music that's it yeah and, and then you were always going to create a new anthem and, we, yeah. and the, the idea was that we were going to pair you with like a producer right but it we were imagining like the third act was going to be you in the studio creating the song. Right, right. And then at some point, and I, I honestly do not know when this emerged, we started rewinding that a little bit to say, you can't just jump into the studio and do that. You need to do right. some research. You need to sort of absorb your own version of the American music story. How do you do that? You, know, you go, you're a musician, like, let's, play. Let, let's go play with some mus exactly. musicians. And that <laughs> led to like, oh, okay, well, we could film here, here, here. Detroit, you know, we could film in New Orleans. We could film in Nashville. Um, and then I, I started having a vision of a Winnebago and like a road trip. Right, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I love road trips. Yeah. <laughs> I've, done, I've done two of them. But not necessarily you as like a central character right. in, in, sure. in the film. And I think that that's really the change that was most significant you and, and eventually Dahi kind of as central characters. And I know that, um, at some point the reality of that must have presented itself to you. And I'm just curious, what's that like from your perspective? Because I felt like I always talk about, um, 
the responsibility of being a documentary filmmaker. And what you have to do is you have to get people's trust and you have to mm -hmm. say, hey, you know, will you be in my documentary? And if so, you have to sign this, this waiver. <laughs> sure. But just because you sign the waiver doesn't mean you can run roughshod over people. Like mm -hmm. that you, you have to recognize and always have your antenna attuned to if someone's uncomfortable. And if you shoot an incredible scene that would win you an Academy Award, what's your responsibility to that? If that person's uncomfortable with that scene, would you pull that scene from mm -hmm. a movie? Would you change the movie? Mm -hmm. If someone was uncomfortable... Um, and I kind of had this uneasy sense that, man, this isn't necessarily what you signed up for, but that the train was, had left the station and that it was like really hard for you to stop the train and say, Hey, whoa, whoa, like what's going on here? Did you ever have that? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> feeling? Cause you never really came to me. I mean, you did in some subtle ways. I picked up on it, but you never came to me and said, Hey Pete, we need to stop this film. Uh, this isn't what I signed up for or at the very least, we need to have a serious conversation. Did you have that conversation with other people? Yeah, I, I, I think a form of that conversation, because I think what I always came back to, like I mentioned before, was my trust in you as a filmmaker. And I think that, like, I tend to... It's, I think the older I get, the more I, I uh, try not to do this, but most of my life, I've, like jumped first and like made the calculations later, essentially, you know, even going back to my film concerto as a conversation, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll write a violin concerto. And then after I said, yes, I was like, oh man, I have no idea how to do this. I'm like, what do I do? But I feel like I keep doing that because it, every time I, I make it through those situations, I grow so much as an artist. And also I feel like it doesn't give me a chance to be, to deal with the fear uh, until I'm in a situation where I have to really grapple with that that fear in a real way you know i think if i had made the calculation early on when you first came to me that fear maybe would have come up in a way that would have made me said you know say no and i think that like being in this like you know slowly boiling water essentially as far as like the shifting aspect of of the story had that fear continue to come up and had you know, i then had to like confronted and and i'm also the type of person that's not going to immediately come to you and be like you know what this is not what we talked about and like i, I right. can't do this anymore especially because right. you know i feel like we're i i really feel like as collaborators we're teammates right so like yeah. i want to do whatever i can to make sure that we're all feeling as comfortable as possible and i also feel like to walk away from something just based on fear is is not a, a great way to live and so mm. for me i always was just like Okay, I'm. I did have conversations with my manager that were just like, I'm feeling this feeling of discomfort. Can you help me like talk through it, essentially? And mm -hmm. I think what I always came back to was like, I trust Pete, and I also really appreciate the fact that like, you know, the type of filmmaker you are. I didn't feel like I was going to be put in some sort of situation where I was going to regret how I was presented or regret how you decided to frame the conversation. And now I'm, my voice is being lent toward this like this version of the story that I don't agree with in terms mm -hmm. of like how you're, you're presenting, you know, how I feel about the anthem or how, or how one should feel about the anthem, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then also, like you mentioned, I feel like I'm glad you felt it was subtle because I, I felt like I was like almost like on a weekly basis, like, man, you know what, Pete, actually I'm having these other feelings and these other fears that are coming up and like, you know, what can we do about this? What are we going to do about this? And I really appreciate that every conversation you as the filmmaker are dealing with opinions from producers and your own vision and like, yeah. And this story that's like developing and, and coming into its own over time. And so to also allow me that voice to articulate like, or that space to articulate any sort of nervousness I was feeling or any sort of like uh, reasoning why I felt that way, you know, I think was also another thing that contributed to me feeling like it was worth continuing. I'm not going to lie. Like there was a lot of pressure. Hmm. And there were a lot of people who did say no, that we right. went to um, producers that we wanted to pair you with who were afraid of the reaction that might occur in the wake of a film calling into question the national anthem or a film experimenting with creating a new anthem. Like, mm -hmm. what's the reaction going to be for that? Right. And so I'm deeply grateful for your trust and for your ability to to navigate that. And obviously we found a producer, Dahi, yeah. to pair with you that really truly created something magical. And then we brought on some artists, Ruby Amanfu, Charity Bowden, 
Joy Harjo, who's the first Native American poet laureate, and Cecilia Peña Govea. Mm -hmm. And I was being asked by each of them, I think beyond just you as a collaborator, to, um, they were putting their trust in me. Mm -hmm. They were stepping into and expressing perspectives that didn't always align with each other. If we're going to talk about the American story and we're going to talk about the idea of an anthem, like how do you frame that conversation? And in and, and what ways do we frame it? It was challenging and difficult. And I hope some of that comes out in the film, that these are not easy conversations, but that we have to sort of put each other in these rooms with each other to have these conversations in a way that's uh, authentic to the complexity and difficulty of it, but also in some way honoring the power of an expressive voice, even if it involves people expressing that voice in, in different ways or contradictory ways. Yeah. Do you feel like you ever had a moment where you felt like, especially before there was so much support where you were like, man, maybe, maybe this is not a good idea. Maybe this is something I should just let go of. I, you know, I was frustrated by some of the people who said no. Mm. You know, we were talking to a lot of some A-list artists and there was an idea in the beginning that, oh, maybe we, it's kind of like a we are the world right. kind of situation. And so we did do some outreach to some bigger names. And at times it felt either transactional, the response that we got, we knew it was going to be difficult in that sense, mm. or that there was a concern over the sort of political nature of the project and that people, the people really want to be part of a project that's going to potentially be divisive or get attacked. I personally love that. I love the urgency of it. I love the messiness. I, I love, and it sort of goes back to sort of me making my own personal story, which I, I you know, I made The Wolf as my first film. I, I figured if I'm going to spend a career pointing the camera and the microphone at other people, I might as well start with myself. Hmm. And sort of asking my, my father point blank, are you an alcoholic, really, is the essence of that. It's a difficult question. The answer may not be what I want or need, but there's something um, healing hmm. about that, just in the asking of the question. Hmm. And I felt that this project kind of represented that for me. Like there are questions that we need to be asking about our history, about our story, about our voice. And I also just deeply respect the creation of beauty, of, of music, of film, of art. I, I just love it. I think it takes us to an emotional place and it allows us to see ourselves in the, our communities and our, our country in, in new ways. And that's what I felt that this project could do. And that's why I felt it was worth pushing and trying to continue to ask people to trust and step into difficult spaces. And, and I'm grateful that everybody was able to do that mm. to the end. Okay, so now we're at our Prox Rex segment, which is where we, you know, introduce our listeners to ideas, inspirations, things that we feel have moved us or are inspirations for us in our art. What would you say? Uh, would you keep it in the music category? So I was just thinking about that. I feel like the first thing that actually came to mind is not music related per se, but it's um, Carl Jung's A Man and the Symbols. I feel like I've just been reading a lot of Carl Jung and I feel like what we've been talking about just in terms of like exploring these aspects of our own histories or other parts of ourselves and our psyche and like representing that through art. I think for me, it's been really helpful to read more about how that's even operating in my own mind so I can then like see what I can pull from emotionally and artistically. Um, and then I'll say on the music side, just to keep it with Anthem, you know, being really inspired by the fact that the Woodstock performance of uh, by Jimi Hendrix of, of the Star Spangled Banner is not his only version of that, that that was something he was workshopping and doing on a regular basis. And to hear more than just that version of it, I think just shows how much he was trying to put into that rendition of the piece. I think, you know, when you're telling your own story in music, it's not as evident because mm -hmm. there's no 
Uh, I mean, I guess there's sometimes there's lyrics, but for orchestral stuff or sort of jazz, yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah, it's less common. Yeah, I think for me, yeah, you know, my recommendations circle around the idea of memoir, just because that's how I started my career, and I I was told about this book called Art of the Memoir by Mary Carr, and that book talks about sort of that process of um, reflecting on your own story. And also the process of reflecting on your own story through a process of memoir is powerful. And you don't have to be a professional filmmaker or a musician to do that. You can journal, you can write privately, you can, you know, have a conversation with your grandfather, <laughs> sure. you know, you can, you don't have to make a film about it. And I think that these engagements or these mindful explorations can do a lot towards helping us heal, helping us inspire ourselves to reach our full potential mm. and that's what we hope that anthem will do mm. is um potentially inspire people to think about um either create their own anthem yeah. um yeah. or just to think about you know the idea of not just a anthem for the country but an anthem for self or an anthem for family or an anthem for community because these are the sort of frameworks that we use to move through difficult moments Mm. and to stay optimistic and to ultimately point toward the future. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, Chris, thanks for uh, coming out and talking about a whole variety of things, including Anthem. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Thanks for the conversation. In Proximity is a production of Proximity Media. If you like the show, be sure to follow, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And tell your friends and loved ones to do the same. Sharing and reviewing really helps other people find our show. So please, if you have a moment, write us a review and share a link with a friend. Anthem is directed by Pete Nix and is produced by Ryan Kugler and executive produced by Zinzi Kugler and Savo Hanian with our partners at Onyx Collective and This Machine. Anthem streams on Hulu on June 28th. Learn more and read transcripts of this episode and others on proximitymedia.com. Don't forget to follow at Proximity Media on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. The show is produced by me, Paula Mardo. Executive producers are Ryan Kugler, Zinzi Kugler, Sevo Hanian, and me. Our theme song and additional music is composed by Ludwig Gorenson. Ken Nana is our sound designer and mix engineer. Paulina Cherizova is our production assistant. Audio editing for this episode is by Cameron Kell. Special thanks to the whole Proximity Media team, Courtney Archard, and to you for listening to In Proximity. We're taking next week off for the holiday, and we'll be back after that. So be sure to watch Anthem, and see you next time. It's definitely my first, like, public film. <laughs> I, I made um, uh, my own short film a few years before that, it's actually how I met Ben Proudfoot. And it was kind of like, you know, putting myself through film school, essentially. Like I wrote a little short script and filmed the short and saw it and never showed it to anybody. <laughs> Wait, was that the project that you were working on when we met? Yeah, exactly. Oh, never, wow. never saw the light of day. <laughs> Where is this? Where? How do we see this? Uh, it's it's on my private Vimeo page. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, send, I'll send you a link. Yeah. <laughs>